A year ago this month, the 100th anniversary of Crockett's death was marked by a series of events, including the republication of 32 of his Galloway-based novels as the Galloway Collection and the setting up of the SR Crockett Society, the Galloway Raiders. One year later, people are beginning to catch on to the Galloway novelist and enjoy his stories and their landscape all over again. You too can explore Crockett's Galloway by visiting some of the places he wrote about in his fiction. For example, April sees the reopening of Threve Castle, which closes for the winter. Accessible only by boat, this is the stronghold of the Douglas family and is especially linked to Archibald the Grimm, the third Earl of Douglas. In The Black Douglas, Crockett writes, The waning moon cast a pale light across the landscape and he could see the tents on the castle island glimmer greyish-white beneath him. Beyond that again was the shining confluence of the sluggish river about the isle and the dark line of the woods of Balmagee opposite. Crockett wrote two novels set in and around Threve, set in the 15th century. The first, The Black Douglas, tells the story of the Earls of Douglas and also the ordinary folk, including Sholto and Lawrence McKim, who provide the novel's real heroism. It also offers evocative descriptions of Threve Castle itself. For example, he writes, Close by the last turn of the turret staircase yawned the iron-sparred mouth of the dungeon, in which in its time many a notable prisoner had been immured. It was closed with a huge grid of curved iron bars, each as thick as a man's arm, cunningly held together by a gigantic padlock. Above all, the Black Douglas is a gothic tale, and the supernatural is never far away. It's strangely reminiscent of Keats's poem La Belle Dame Sans Merci. It's an old-style romance, with werewolves and superstition mingling with the knights and fair maidens. On Sholto's first night of guard duty, he is scared near witless. He had also a vague sense of being watched by presences invisible to him, but malign in their nature. Again and again he caught himself listening for footsteps which seemed to dog his own. He heard mysterious whisperings that flouted his utmost vigilance, and mocking laughter that lurked in unseen crevices and broke out as soon as he had passed. His feet hardly touched the stone stairs as he flew downwards, and wings were added to his haste by the sounds of fear which continued to increase. In another moment he was upon the last step of the turnpike, and at the entrance of the corridor which led to the rooms of the little Lady Margaret and Maud Lindsay. As Sholto came running down the steep descent from the roof, he caught sight of a dark and shaggy beast, running on all fours, just turning out of the corridor and taking the first step of the descent towards the floor beneath. Contemporary readers of The Black Douglas were warned against the horrors of the book, with critics suggesting no one who has weak nerves should touch this book, and it is no puling, weak, milk-and-water sorcery Mr Crockett gives us, but the black art of the deepest, most genuine kind. While we may be used to sterner stuff and find Crockett's episodic style unusual at first, the rapidly paced, almost breathless story can make your head spin as it takes you on quite a journey into the past. It is more Dracula than Ivanhoe, but it shares the best of both of these, and adds a unique vision of Threve in its natural environment. The second novel, Maid Margaret, is a sequel of sorts, told through the eyes of Margaret Douglas. In The Black Douglas we see her as a child, but in this sequel she's grown to womanhood. The Douglas-Stewart conflict is given a whole new perspective in Crockett's novel, and through Margaret we can see what it was like to be a woman in medieval times, especially one whose marriage can serve a purpose in the political arena. But Margaret is wild and petulant, more like Catherine Earnshaw in Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights than anything else, and she brings a sense of reality to the dynastic power struggles of the time, allowing the reader to feel truly involved in an individual love story. The Siege of Three provides an absolute high point to the story, and I would recommend it to anyone visiting Threve Castle. The chapters where Margaret and her entourage shelter in the castle's dungeon Archibald the Grimm should enliven a visit to the castle, allowing the reader to imagine it in times gone past with a vividness that is often lacking when trying to imagine life back into such a ruin. Crockett writes, Those who have only seen the castle afterwards, a desolate and marvellous ruin, tear into the skies with its riven sides and crumbled battlements, yet for all that grimly erect in its majesty, can have no idea of the terror of these hours when the whole building seemed ready to dissolve into a heap of stones, not one remaining upon the other. Crockett also fictionises the Siege of Roxburgh in his novel, and he offers details on the Canon Mons Meg. In his version, it was built by the McKims, and it's used to devastating effect in the death of James II. If you want to breathe life back into Freve Castle, I can strongly recommend reading the books before or during a visit. I can think of little better on a sunny day in April than curling up in the walls of Threve Castle with a copy of either or both of these books and letting my imagination run riot. But be warned, if you don't hear voices from the past while reading Crockett at Threve, you have no romance in your soul. So if you're interested in medieval Scottish history, in the Douglas clan, or just in Threve and its place in the landscape and the history of Galloway, 
then reading these stories after a visit will allow you to touch the parts that cameras cannot reach. And remember, these are just two of a huge collection of fiction written by Crockett, exploring Galloway from the 15th century right up to the 20th century. So why not make this the year that you discover Crockett's Galloway?